So, Eric, when you look in the night sky, I don't know if you're anything like me, but I, I think, you know, are, are we the only intelligent life out there? I often think, are we the best intelligent life? And then yeah. I have this, to question that and say, surely, I hope not. Is, is this as good as it gets? <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever thought about that, then you've probably thought about the Fermi paradox. You didn't realize it at the time. I did not realize it. I think that's what we're going to talk about today. From a child born into this world, we are taught what to believe. Close-minded, we become fearful to be deceived. Still, we desire to know what lies beyond that locked door. The art of the storyteller, conjuring tales of legend and lore. History hidden, lost knowledge, things forgotten and the unknown. These are the things that direct us and will set the tone. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Nightmares on the Lost Highway. So before we dig too deep into this rabbit hole, I do want to say we're going to talk about some topics. We don't want to challenge anyone's religious beliefs, but we're going to talk about evolution. May not cross any borders, but we're definitely yeah. going to knock on the doors of the thresholds. Well, we're going to look into what science says, you know, how long the galaxy's been around, the universe. So understand that we're not trying to challenge or belittle anyone. This is just, well, we're going to talk about this from the scientific perspective. But the Fermi Paradox was named for Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi. And it's my understanding that he kind of laid the groundwork for this idea, but other scientists came after and sort of fleshed out the concept. From the, the SETI website, and if you're not familiar with SETI, that is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we have the following quote, which I thought was a good place to start here. Fermi realized that any civilization with a modest amount of rocket technology and an immodest amount of imperial incentive could rapidly colonize the entire galaxy. Within 10 million years, every star system could be brought under the wing of the empire. 10 million years may sound long, but in fact, it's quite short compared with the age of the galaxy, which is roughly 10,000 million years old. Colonization of the Milky Way should be a quick exercise. Does make sense. The apparent contradiction here is between the lack of evidence of extraterrestrial life and the various high estimates of the probability of extraterrestrial life. And I want to get into uh, the science here a little bit to kind of... We, we kind of got to have a foundation to build on. You've got to have the foundation to build on before we get to the what I consider the interesting part or the, the nightmarish part of the Fermi Paradox. So let's let's start here. There are billions of stars in the Milky Way, similar to our sun. There's a high probability that some of these would have an Earth-like planet in their habitable zone. And the habitable zone is that comfortable Goldilocks spot distant enough from the star that it doesn't get burned up by said star, and yet close enough to the star... You don't freeze to, as yeah, well. Yeah, you don't freeze, which our Earth in our solar system is in that Goldilocks zone. We're close enough that we get the energy from the sun far enough away that we're not being burned to a cinder. Now, many of these uh, stars are much older than our own sun. And estimates say that as many as one in five of those sun-like stars could have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. So if Earth is considered typical, then some of these other planets would surely have evolved intelligent life by now. And I would say I definitely fit in that category. I want to be the believer. Yeah. I mean, out of all the instances that's out there, surely to goodness, I mean, yeah. we're not the only ones. Now, if these civilizations are older than we are, we'd have to assume that at some point they would have developed interstellar travel. Uh, if you want to think of it on this terms, we, we're almost there. We have developed the ability to travel to our nearest neighbor in space, which is our own moon, if you, if you believe that happened. <laughs> we're currently toying with the idea of traveling to our nearest planet, mm -hmm. which would be Mars. And we have developed probes that can go beyond the limits of our currently known solar system. So we as a, a race, we have become a spacefaring race. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a potential for us to become an interplanetary race in, in what well, I think the estimates are the next 30 years. We're, we're not at that Star Trek, Star Wars, Stargate uh, analysis yet, but yeah. uh, we're knocking but we're uh, getting hard it. on the door. Yes. So at, at the speed of, of current interstellar travel, you could cross the Milky Way completely in a few million years. And that is with you know our understanding of, of interplanetary travel. So since there's so many of these stars that are similar to our own sun, that would have so many planets similar to our own planet out there, we should have already been visited 
by extraterrestrial intelligence or their probes. Yeah, to your point, we're relatively new kids on the block, if you will, with our system. In, in the blink of an eye, humanity has existed, and we've gone from primitive hunter-gatherers pummeling things with sticks and rocks <laughs> to the ability to travel to space on a semi-regular basis. But now, you know, some are going to say, well, we have obviously got alien visitors there's roswell well there's you know the the new 2020 military release of for video the, footage for the purpose of this particular podcast i understand that some of our topics imply we've been visited by aliens <laughs> so with this one we're going to go with the accepted scientific standard of there is no proof. we really don't have any hardcore proof we can't yeah. take you to the back room and say meet clyde he's he's the alien from you yeah know. we have a lot of a lot of theories and a lot of stories, Roswell, Rendlesham Forest, you know, things like that. But but there's no scientific proof that we've been visited by extraterrestrials. Now, there are some, some facts, uh, some hypotheses that would kind of highlight these apparent contradictions. Things that we should be able to look out into the night sky or turn our telescopes in the right direction and say, okay, there, there's alien life. First of all, we, we, we're going to assume that radio technology is sort of a standard. We developed radio technology. And, uh, you know, we're casting our radio waves out there into the galaxy. If an outside observer was to look at our solar system, it would, they would note that there's unusually intense radio waves for a star of our size. And that should draw their attention. You, you know, would hey, think. Hey, you know, there's, there's these transmissions coming from this little planet here. And, you know, our, our television, our telecommunications, our radio waves, I mean, those are all Everybody's out there. Everybody's got the a cell phone these days. I mean, all of this is out there. And, and yeah, you watch the old sci-fi, you know, shows where they're like, oh, we came here because of your... You know, I love Lucy or whatever. I heard Elvis. <laughs> you could look directly at a planet. The large-scale artificial lighting that we use as human beings is detectable from space. If you looked at our planet from a distance, you would see that it's brighter than a planet should be. Much like when you're driving down a uh, an old highway at dark and you can see a light from such a long distance away. Yeah. Now, an advanced civilization could send interstellar probes out into the galaxy. We've, we've done, we've done that it with the Voyager probes. And if you're familiar with your old Star Trek, that, that comes back to haunt us eventually. You know, a significantly advanced civilization could put self-replicating probes out there that would collect in the resources and build, you know, rebuild themselves or build additional probes. And it would be possible in that way to explore the Milky Way within, you know, a million years. You know, and, and another, this is sort of a hypothetical proposed, a kind of a sci-fi concept almost, but what they call the Bracewell probe, which would be a, a sort of an artificially intelligent probe. Again, you talk about a significantly advanced civilization, instantaneous communication from one end of the galaxy to the other, as far as our understanding of those things, it would be impossible. But a Bracewell probe would arrive with sort of an artificial intelligence and it would conduct, I, I would say you could conduct negotiations on behalf of whatever civilization it's representing. Some true interaction. Any, it, any it, of these things. It kind of comes down to, I mean, if you break it down, we have to assume, or depending on what side of the fence you want to be on. I'm going to assume that, again, we're not the only ones out there, but, you know, maybe our best technology is the, the wagon with square wheels still. <laughs> and then we've got another race out there that's driving in the Jetson cars. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Well, well the, and the further we get, we're going to talk about some of that kind of stuff. You know, something, something else we could be using to, to find alien life would be the, you know, the search for stellar scale artifacts. A significantly advanced civilization would be building on a large scale, you would think. Uh, one of those things, and again, if you're a Star Trek fan, you've heard of the Dyson Sphere. Uh, if you're not familiar with the idea of the Dyson Sphere, it's just simply, you know, an advanced enough culture would be able to harness the power of their own star. And so a Dyson Sphere is like a sort of shell that they would build around the star to harness that energy. So distant stars, we would say, okay, that that's a, and again, I'm not going to delve deeply into the science here, but say like a you know, certain category of star gives off a certain amount of power. Energy. There you go. You know, a certain light signature, and you build a Dyson sphere around it, you stifle that signature, you interfere with that, then we could look at that star and say, okay, well, the light coming from that star is a little weird. Maybe we should look at that one a little more. You know, such a feat of astroengineering would definitely be observable with our current technology. I'm going to jump in here and kind of throw out a few of the things that you may have some more tidbits on, but one of the things that we talked about was SETI. You know, where we have the big satellites and we're, we're trying so hard, you know, look at us, look at us, please hear us, you know, yeah. communicate. But one thing is called the SETI paradox. And th the concept there is an alien civilization might feel it's too dangerous to communicate 
either for themselves or our, ourselves as humanity. You know, we get into a lot of that discussion and we're going to un, it's like an onion with many, many layers. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here and a lot of, there, there's, there's different ways to look at the Fermi paradox as a question and then there's different theories as to why. So, and they literally kind of contradict each other depending yeah, on. Well, and again, it's a paradox. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so we have two versions of the question. Version one of this is, why are there no aliens or their artifacts found here on Earth or in our solar system? Where are they? If interstellar travel is possible, I mean, even a slow kind of interstellar travel should have been able to reach Earth. Right. Going back to where the new kids on the yeah. block, these other systems have existed, they would have had time yeah. to come to us at and, least and, by now. And theoretically, it would only take between 5 and 50 million years to col colonize the entire galaxy. And again, that's our science understanding yeah maybe they have some and way to, yeah. to close that gap by a quarter or a third or whatever so you know since there's so many stars that are older than our sun and intelligent life may have evolved faster or earlier than it did here on earth why has the galaxy not been colonized you know and it could be that it's impractical or undesirable you know we could talk we're going to talk about that later but even a large-scale exploration of the galaxy you know you could do it with probes you wouldn't necessarily have to advertise where you're from yeah. Just send out automated probes to, to poke around and find out. And even probes, you know, maybe we would have found some evidence of probes floating around. And and some people would argue, I know we had an interstellar object cross into our solar system a couple of years back that people thought might not be entirely natural. So, again, maybe we wouldn't recognize it if it did, you know, show up on our doorstep. The other version of the question here is, why do we see no signs of intelligent life elsewhere? We are looking, right? Now, this version of the question would assume that interstellar travel is not so, you know, so common, but it also includes being able to look at the other galaxies that we know to exist. And, uh, you know, these other distant galaxies, I mean, it would take, you know, traveling galaxy to galaxy would take an incredible amount of time. You know, when we're talking about these millions of years to pop populate the Milky Way, we're just talking about our galaxy. But uh, a sufficiently advanced civilization could potentially be observable over a uh, uh, you know, a fraction of the size of the observable universe. You, if they're out there to be seen and they're colonizing, you would think we'd be able to to see to see some evidence. But of again, that. one may argue only if they want to be seen. Again, we're going to go with science and what science tells us right now, and that there is no significant evidence of other intelligent life after an estimated thirteen point eight billion years of universal history. As we far as really we really have can, nothing to show. Yeah, as far as we can tell, we're it. A lot of speculation. Now, now, why is that? Could it be that intelligent life is rarer than we would think? Uh, could it be that we've got assumptions about the development and behavior of other intelligent races that are sort of based on us, and so they're wrong? And one may also argue kind of a sadder point. We may be all that yeah. there is. Yeah. Laying the groundwork and looking at the science of, of interstellar travel and the, the length of time that the galaxy and the universe has existed and the potential for the development of life on other planets, we have to ask the question then, where is everybody? Yeah. And I believe that's actually what uh, Fermi ended his conversation. I believe they were like walking on a sidewalk one day and yeah. he and some scientists were talking and that's how he ended the conversation. Where are they? Just, you know, everybody's got different opinions and they're, they're going at it, but he's like, where is the proof? Where are they? Well, Eric, I, uh, I have here, I have it broken down into two different possibilities. So we're going to tackle possibility number one and I'm going to quote it as such. There are no signs of higher civilization because there are no higher civilizations, like and, we said. And, and you told me something going into this podcast. I, I, I personally, I couldn't believe it since the Fermi Paradox has actually been around since like 1951, I, <laughs> I believe. I'd never heard of this. But you said, well, when you start diving into it, it it's kind of got a sad factor. And I didn't yeah. really understand what you meant by that. This is it. Yeah. This is it. See, the, the math would suggest that there'd be thousands of civilizations out there, and some of them would have to be older than humanity. So that means there must be something else going on. Now, that something else is what we call the Great Filter. And the Great Filter, it kind of, it does cast this in kind of a, this, this, this could be bad for humanity. Yeah. So the Great Filter theory states that at some point, um, in any pre-galactic civilization, there's some sort of barrier wall that we hit that stops us from being able to become a galactic civilization. Um, the real question is, where on the timeline does the Great Filter fall? So, And let's face it, we do a great job of killing yeah. ourselves, polluting ourselves, you know. So here, here's the thing, you know, the, the Great Filter. We hope that it's behind us. 
we hope that we as a civilization have advanced beyond the great filter, whatever it may be. And and we'll touch on some things that the great filter itself might actually be. You know, maybe we are rare. Maybe human life and, and, and civilization is advanced at our, as ours, which honestly, sometimes we don't seem very advanced, <laughs> but maybe we are rare. Maybe we have gotten past the great filter and we're one of the first. Yep. So this would explain why we haven't seen other advanced civilizations. There are none. Yeah. And in one possibility, maybe the great filter happens at the very beginning. Maybe complex life itself is so rare. When you make that transition from simple cell to complex cell to multicellular organism, maybe life is so rare out there that the great filter is just simply the existence of life in the first place. Maybe we did get past the great filter. Maybe, maybe life beginning is, is where the filter is. That's at. the positive glass half full. Yeah. That's the best way. You're like, we, we would consider ourselves lucky if that ends up being the case. Unfortunately, that would mean that there may not be any other life out there at all. There's Maybe kind of an egotistical aspect of me that's like, yeah, we're the best there is. We're the only ones there is. You know, and, and when you look around and and we see ourselves killing one another and all the corruptness. When, when we like, when we really? politicize science and we listen to what the Kardashians have to say, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also what they call the rare earth hypothesis, which simply means that while there might be many Earth-like planets. None of them are like our Earth. You know, when you talk about being in the habitable zone, we have uh, a gas giant that helps absorb some meteor impacts that keeps rogue comets and stuff from hitting our planet. We have a moon, which orbits our planet, which regulates our tides. It's the perfect storm, yeah, if you will. plate tectonics, the, the chemical composition of our atmosphere, the magnetosphere that we have that blocks us from interstellar radiation. Constantly evolving, protecting you know, like us. Our planet... For, for all that it is, it's just perfect yeah. and is the perfect seed for life. And maybe that just doesn't happen anywhere else. Maybe we're rare. Maybe we're just the first. Uh, maybe, maybe the conditions are just now becoming right in the galaxy for us to get to a point where we become a super intelligent civilization. And it just hasn't happened yet. Maybe we're the first that are going to get there. You know, it could be that at the beginning of the universe's existence, it was full of cataclysmic events. If you look at Earth in the beginning with, with seismic upheaval and volcanoes and the, the radical shifts in, in oh, the Oh, age of the dinosaurs and, that, yeah. and yes. Yeah. So, you know, you know, here I make a note, you know, maybe, you know, gamma ray bursts. When a, when a star goes supernova, some of them emit these huge gamma ray bursts, which would literally incinerate anything in their own yeah. solar system. Right. And even, even if one of our nearest stars were to do that, it would completely wreak havoc on our Earth's ecosystem. It would destroy all life on our planet if we were hit by a gamma ray burst. Well, then you have the whole thing with meteor and asteroids, yeah. you know, possibly hitting, knocking us off of our axis and cultures. So, and so yeah, what if, what if conditions have just now started to become right for the evolution of, of intelligent life? And that's where we're at. Maybe there's millions of cultures out there, but they're all right about the same place we are. Okay. And now here's, you know, if the filter isn't behind us and hmm. we're not right there, then that means it's ahead of us. Hang on for the roller coaster so, ride. So, yeah, we're doomed. We've had other, <laughs> there were other races that beat us to it, but literally it's a race to extinction. Well, yeah. Um, you know, maybe there's something that says that life does develop, but that something prevents it from getting much further than where we're, where we are now. Something keeps life from reaching a high enough intelligence to be able to reach out and become a spacefaring civilization. And if that's the case, you know, we're unlikely to be the exception. What what would make Earth exceptional at that point? So again, we're going to say that cataclysmic natural events in the solar system, maybe they're just common enough that they wipe out civilizations on a regular basis. Again, talk about the gamma ray burst. Maybe they happen at such a regularity that no civilization advances past where we're at now. Yeah. Um, another, it's literally the roll of the dice. Yeah. Or Or maybe... Maybe uh, another possibility is that all intelligent life ends up destroying itself mm. once they reach a certain level of technology. If we're not proof of that, I don't know what would be. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. You know, you look at how we've treated our primary natural resource, which is the very planet we live on, mm -hmm. and, and we seem to be hell-bent on destroying each other and, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, look at what has happened through our own short history. Let's let's pick the, uh, the Native Americans and what yeah. we've done. I mean, whenever races come together it's usually not an open hand extension of well, friendship i mean honestly we're we're a savage species very we elevate ourselves above you know the rest of the planet and yet we still focus on destroying each other 
I mean, look at the amount of money the American government pours into the defense spending. I had a science teacher in school, and, and this may be semi-inappropriate, but I, I, I have to share this because it's something that stuck in my head. He says, as smart as we think we are, with all the science and all of our developments, he said, you do realize we still wipe our rear ends with a piece of paper. Well, some people use water. <laughs> that's true. That's the really technically advanced. But that stuck in my head a lot. I mean, it's like, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a... Sorry to trip you up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so Oxford University philosopher Nick Bostrom says in regards to the the great filter here, and, and looking out beyond our, our own solar system and our own intelligence, the new, no news is good news as far as he's concerned. <laughs> the discovery of simple life on Mars could be devastating because if that means that, that they got past a certain point but that their filter came later, that would cut out a, a, a number of potential great filters that were behind us. Uh, if we found fossilized complex life on Mars, that means we're not to our filter yet. Yeah, yeah. And in, in his own words, it would be by far the worst news ever printed on a newspaper cover because it would mean the great filter is ahead of us. So whatever it is that stops us from becoming this intergalactic, super intelligent spacefaring species, you know, we're, we're not there yet. We're not to that barrier. We haven't figured out to cross it. Now, possibility two, as we delve into this one, is where some of the really, a lot of the theories that, that come now are going to be ones that are kind of almost nightmarish at times. But possibility two is intelligent civilizations are out there and there are reasons why we haven't heard from them. Exactly. With this possibility, we have to assume there's nothing particularly special or rare about Earth, that civilizations develop all the time, that there are civilizations that have been around longer than us and that have been able to achieve advances in technology and, and have become spacefaring life forms. Could it be that it is the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself? You know, they say that the progress of technology on Earth is driven by two factors, the struggle for domination and the desire for an easy life, and that the former leads to possibly the complete destruction of all human life, and that the latter could lead to biological or mental degeneration, which prohibits us from becoming spacefaring. So either we're going to try to dominate over the others and kill each other, or we're going to try to have an easy life, and if you've ever seen the movie Idiocracy, you might know where this is going, because, you know, maybe we just lose the will or the desire to become a spacefaring species. Or... You know, there's other things. Maybe, you know, we we could lead to our own destruction through any number of ways. You know, major global issues, war, accidental environment contamination, development of biotechnology that runs rampant, uh, synthetic life that takes over the planet, resource depletion, which I think we're well on our way to. Exactly. Climate yep. change, which we're certainly, we have a hand in. A lot of talk. Yep. Um, or even poorly designed artificial intelligence. And we are poking around with artificial intelligence all the time. And if you've paid attention to any of the stories on artificial intelligence, some of these intelligences, I believe one of them immediately jumped to the conclusion that maybe Hitler wasn't going far enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> so... Uh, again, you let's, know, you, let's repeat our yeah. mistakes at, yeah. at high volume. <laughs> Skynet may not be so far off the, the base where, you know, maybe an, a suitable intelligence would just be like, no, you got to get rid of these humans. Well, and, and I touched upon it, and I'll go back to it. The, the whole SETI paradox that, yeah, let's just say we're a dot of many that exist, but alien, there may be a, a dominant alien super breed out there. Yeah. L let's pick on the movie series like The Predator, if you will, and other we're communicating and everyone is out there listening, but they're afraid to respond because it one might bring a blip to their solar system or it might reveal us. Now, how ironic would that be? We're over here. Hey, look at us, look at us, look at us. And you know, think whoever the great God above or yeah. whatever your beliefs are that nobody's answered us yet because yeah. it could be a very, very bad yeah. thing. Well, here we are broadcasting like, Hey, look at us, look at us. And know. we're like a cockroach under their feet. Yeah. You know, just, uh, shut these guys up. They're, they're just ready to wipe us out because we're a nuisance. We touched on this a little earlier, you know, but when technologically advanced civilizations encounter lesser advanced civilizations, they do tend to wipe the lesser civilization out. So that whole dominance thing. Would we want to encounter a civilization that has the ability to travel between the stars? Cause Obviously, we're not there yet. They just show up here, wipe us out, and take our resources. Maybe intelligent life could have already visited us, but it happened before us. intelligent human life it, was it here. It happened before us. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we sentient humans have only been around for about 50,000 years, and recorded history only goes back 5,500 years. So, 
you know, there could have been cavemen, you know, painting on cave walls. How are they going to tell us that they met aliens? You know, that's, that's, they, they, they probably couldn't even conceive of a world beyond what they were experiencing. Maybe the galaxy has been colonized and we just live in some little backwater desolate area of the galaxy that no one comes to. I, I love the one that, um, I think it's called the zoo hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, where basically we, we will assume some intelligent extraterrestrial life does in fact exist and they have made contact with earth. Maybe they felt sorry for us. Maybe they knew <laughs> we were fragile. So they like put us in a little fishbowl and we're that goldfish in a New York apartment up on a shelf. And it's kind of the whole matrix theory that to protect us and our little brains, we don't know what goes on beyond that room behind that door that we're in New York or whatever's there. Well, and you could also kind of look at, at Star Trek with the prime directive that you don't interfere yes. with a lesser advanced society. And maybe and they maybe watch us, that. they observe us, and it's literally like a zoo. You know, you, you watch the animals, but, uh, you know, try not to feed the animals. Maybe the concept of galactic colonization is sort of backwards to a more advanced species. Maybe, maybe conquest is, is something that they grow beyond. You know, maybe, uh, maybe, uh, you know, a civilization with advanced enough energy gathering ability, maybe they created the perfect world for themselves and they don't need to expand beyond that. Yeah, they have no you desire. Know, space is cold and empty and dangerous and, and they've built their own utopia. So wh why? Why would you venture beyond that? If you had a perfect environment, why would you leave it? To touch on that a little bit more and go back to the whole zoo hypothesis, you know, there's going to be our listeners out there that's like, but, but, but we, we have seen UFOs. We've got video footage. There's even a paradox for that, that the intelligent life forces that are out there are like, you know, don't mess with earth for whatever reason. They're yeah. too fragile. They're, they have nothing to offer us. Why would we go there? But then just like our society, maybe there's teenage aliens that jump in their UFOs and do <laughs> drive-bys. around yeah, they, you know, us. Th there's a no trespassing sign. Let's see what lies on the other side. So that's the ones that we're seeing. And then, of course, they're kind of wiped out because they get home and mom and dad take the keys to the UFO. Yeah. And, you know, that's just, that's as far as you're going to go. I do want to talk about the super predator civilization. There's a couple different sort of ideas there. Uh, one, like you said, maybe there's a super predator civilization out there that the rest of the galaxy knows not to communicate Absolutely with. Absolutely terrified of. Or, or you know, another aspect of that is maybe there is only one super predator civilization. Maybe there's an advanced enough civilization that they've sort of conquered the universe and they just wait for a civilization to become dangerous before they destroy it. Maybe we just haven't become dangerous yet. Again, we're, we're maybe racing to that extinction. Yeah. Maybe it just... You know, why waste the resources of exterminating something that's not bothering you? If you've got an anthill out in the yard, you're not going to take the time to destroy it unless those ants start to bother you in some capacity. Yeah. Or maybe there's plenty of life out there, but our technology is too primitive to understand it. Carl Sagan pointed out it, you know, could be that our minds work exponentially faster or slower than any other form of intelligence. And their attempts to communicate with us are just gibberish to us. They, they think too fast or they think too slow and it's just background noise. Maybe we're receiving contact from intelligent life, but the government's hiding it? Oh, yes. The whole government conspiracy thing. I don't have a whole lot more to go on than just saying that, because, you know, we'd like to believe that the government would tell us the truth, but uh, well, we've well, already done one episode about what the government knows and doesn't know. And, I mean, you could argue that for, for days and days, you know, is, is the government, if this is occurring, is the government just trying to protect us because if people knew it, it would just be mass hysteria? Or is it that we're just banking that, yeah, I know they came, they visited, but we're just hoping they just, those teenagers just yeah. drove through and they went out the other side of the fence. Maybe the discovery of extraterrestrial life is just too difficult for us. Maybe we're not listening right. We've been using the wrong resources. You know, and, we're still and, using the telegraph. Yeah. <laughs> well, and let's be honest, the sheer size of the search that we would have to do. So it, vast. It, the scope of it is just beyond imagining. You know, you'd have to span the entire universe. And and we we don't de devote many resources to SETI, so uh, and maybe the sensitivity of modern instruments. You know, SETI estimates that using a radio telescope as sensitive as the Arecibo Observatory, Earth's television and radio broadcast would be detectable only up to zero point three light years away. That's not very far on no, you no. know galactic terms. And again, you got to consider. You know, they estimate that as many as five hundred billion billion sun-like stars with a hundred billion billion earth-like planets our, yeah. our little minds can't comprehend well, the vastness of again our, our signals have only gone one-tenth of the distance to our nearest star to our our nearest star so yeah, yeah. 
and that's the you know our our back of the property, if you will. Yeah, and or, or maybe we just haven't been trying long enough. You know, our ability to detect intelligent alien life has only existed for a very brief period of our own history. You know, you talked about the zoo hypothesis, you know, higher intelligence are aware of us and are observing us, but we're just kind of like a national park, (laughs) you know, look, but don't touch. Uh, Maybe higher civilizations are all around us. We're just too primitive to perceive them. Don't even comprehend it. I'm not sure you've heard of Michio Kaku. He pops up in a lot of the alien documentaries, but he says it, he says it best. Let's say we have an anthill in the middle of the forest, and right next to the anthill, we're building a 10-lane superhighway. And the question is, would the ants be able to understand what a 10-lane superhighway is? Would the ants be able to understand the technology and the intentions of the beings building the highway next to them? Or do they just wander onto the highway and just go squish? Maybe they're so far beyond us, we just don't even get it. Or, and and here's the, the last bullet point I have on this, maybe we're absolutely wrong about our interpretation of reality. Do we do we live in a hologram? The whole matrix. Theory. Are we? Yeah. Are we part of a computer simulation that we're all plugged into? We just happen to be in the basement of that teenage well, alien's house. That's we're just some science experiment. What if we're the aliens? <laughs> what if we're the aliens? What if we were the last surviving remnants of a crashed ship, or 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 we were deposited here by another intelligence for I guess some reason? That sir, uh, to me, that is so sad and grim. I mean, and. Our human nature is to always ask and want more and, and, and try to, to probe and try to find answers. And we're just so lost. We, we don't even have a compass. Yeah, we when, don't even have a clue. When you talk about the Fermi paradox and you, you think about like just the sheer numbers of it, you, numbers wise, we shouldn't be alone. And yet, as far as we can tell, again, barring all the UFO and alien stories that we have, we're just looking at this from the purely scientific today. But the fact that we're alone is, is almost scary. Because why are we alone? What is it that, that makes us so special? You know, maybe, were we just forgotten? Maybe we haven't. Like I said, maybe we haven't hit our filter yet. What is that filter? Let's we, be honest. We seem to be well on our way to wiping ourselves out as a species. So, and maybe that's part of the whole plan. Is if there is other aliens, it maybe we're one test tube up on a shelf of thousands of yeah. millions, and they're just observing to say, well, I wonder how long. This planet will last before they kill themselves, or will it be different from the other billion before them? Yeah. And again, like, you know, we go back to that any significantly advanced civilization destroys itself. Uh, in my research, I found some other references to, you know, maybe they, maybe they create such advanced virtual realities for themselves that they don't feel the need to, we're to just reach not out. important enough. Or, you know, one of those was maybe their media becomes so all engrossing that they lose the desire. You know, and, and when you think about the people that stay plugged into Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatnot all day long. That becomes their world, their reality. And and they don't care. Nope. You know, it, there's a, it's a clip from a TV show. I don't remember the name of it now, but it had Jeff Daniels in it, which if you don't know who Jeff Daniels is, he's, you know, pretty famous actor. He's been in a lot of stuff, but he, he talks about what makes America, they're, they're trying to talk about what makes America great. And he says that America is not as great as you think it is. And one of the things is that we're starting to turn our back on science. You know, you remember a time when, when astronauts Very were, true. those were national heroes. Mm-hmm. We looked up to those guys and the scientists that put them on the moon. You know, those were, those were people to be revered. And now society is more intrigued with, uh, reality TV yeah. shows. Yeah. What are the, what are the real housewives doing this week? Yeah. Cause that's all that's important. And, uh, kind of scary. If, if we haven't hit our filter yet, then it, that means it's coming. The end, the end of us as a civilization is not far off. We may simply be a big cosmic piñata and just swinging in the wind. If we if we did pass our filter and we're the only ones out there again, that's almost that's almost as scary as the thought that I mm, think nothing else is truly scary when you break it down except for the fact that you're alone and there is no one else there. It, I would hate in in my my mind I would hate to believe that humanity is by itself and alone. Because I feel like, as a civilization, we're not we're not perfect. And, Far and from it. I would like to think that there'd be someone else out there that we could learn from and share ideas with. Now, again, you go back to the analogy of Europeans arriving in the New World, and and they see the the primitive native, and and instead of trying to interact with them and learn how to 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 live side by side, no, this is ours. We're taking it. Yeah. We're going to kill you all to get it. Well, but we. We were smart enough to learn a little bit from them to survive, and then we take it. Yeah. You know, teach us how to plant yeah. corn and how to do that. You know? 
So we're horrible people. Yeah, it's it's and, bred into us. And and what if that's just a trait of life? You know, what if there are other civilizations? Again, you talk about the the, the potential that other life doesn't want to talk about us. What if what if other civilizations have gotten past that and they realize just how dangerous other civilizations are, and they're that's like why a, they don't want to talk to us. Yeah, yeah, they're like ashamed. Yeah. Like, oh crap! You know we we conquered these base instincts, but you still have those humans over there beating each other with baseball bats and whatnot. Yeah. So really, it's it's an interesting concept. There's a lot to it, and if you you want to bar all the conspiracy theories that we've been visited by aliens and that the UFOs are alien life, then it really does ask the question: you know, are we alone? And and I again, I I find that kind of a frightening. I, I'm going to stand my ground for my own reasons, and and I'm going to say I, I believe we are not. I maybe that's just my own self-preservation, but for one, I I would love to think there's something better than our society. We have made a lot of mistakes, and I, while I don't want to get political here, we seem to be doing a good job of erasing history. So maybe we'll get to recreate some of those same mistakes. And oh my gosh, there's got to be a better race. There, there, <laughs> we can't be the best there is. It's just I can't deal with that. So and and, and yeah, that that thought that. This can't be. This can't be the best the universe can do, right? Yeah, I think we've given everyone a lot to 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 think, observe, and and to filter, uh, depending on what <laughs> side you're on. But uh, this is yet another example of the story that you will hear on Nightmares on the Lost Highway. Thank you so much for listening. We'd like to give a shout out to our first uh, paying sponsor, Ravens Loft. That's our family shop here located in uh, Lebanon, Missouri. It's your one-stop gaming, vintage toy, and collectible shop where you can find Star Wars, Transformers, G.I. Joe, comics, final records, role-play gaming, Magic the Gathering, and so much more. We're located here at 223 West Commercial, downtown Lebanon, and also in our second location, uh, also here in Lebanon, at the Heartland Antique Mall. We'd like to thank Ravensloft for again supporting Nightmares on the Lost Highway. I want to take a time to thank the people that helped bring this all together. Uh, Alex Tudor, you can almost call him our producer at this point. Sarah Tudor, who also helps with some of the technical stuff. I want to take a moment to extend thanks to Eric for letting us use his space to record in kind of our makeshift studio. I, in turn, would like to thank Bill for, one, putting up with me <laughs> and uh, using this camaraderie to do something we both very much love and enjoy doing. And thank Bill's family for allowing him to spend all the time to work and clean up our recordings and present them in what uh, you hear in the final uh, terms, uh, the final edition, if you will. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for continuing to, to listen. I know we've got some loyal followers out there. We do this as a labor of love, but we're, we're happy that there are people that enjoy it, as, hopefully, as much as we do. Thank you very much.